before we start, I'll just tell you, I'll just give you a background about why we are doing this and what are we really going to do here. Now, I've personally been a trainer and uh, I've been doing financial training since more than eight years. But then if you ask me who I really am, I've always seen myself as a teacher of finance, but at the same time, a practitioner. So I'm actively involved in investing at a personal level. All my funds, as in I don't believe in investing in fixed deposits or investing in bank accounts. Yes, they are important from a contingency and it's, it's also a part of your portfolio. But I've always been a pure equities guy, apart from the property where I live. And then in my home country, I really don't own anything else other than equities. So all my money is in equities and I've been a believer of long-term investing. And I am really happy to be teaching this. Now here, when I'm discussing all these, my purpose is definitely not what you would have or what you would see in a typical exam prep session where yeah, we have slides and these are the bullets. These are few things that you remember. You have to remember that that's not how the session is going to be run. Here, the purpose is completely practical. We are going to take a company and we are going to analyze it, try to understand it. And not just about financial statements, it's more about investing the bigger things and where do you get the information and what should you be doing? What is really a job of a financial analyst? So all these things is something that you all need to understand, right? And the purpose why I took Starbucks is it's a company that we all understand. We all know what their business is, right? So that was basically the purpose of taking Starbucks as an example. And the entire purpose of this webinar is so that you all get a flavor of what is the role of, uh, of a financial analyst or an equity analyst and what do they really do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? One hour that we have right now is definitely a very, very short time. I don't think we can go over the entire thing, but then... One student, please. Do. Yeah, 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 please, please. So just give me a second. Yeah, sorry. So, and also the other purpose of doing this is, see, at times when you are analyzing a company and see my focus is completely like an investor, not a student, not, a, not, not someone who want to calculate ratios. That is something that you do day to day, right? As in, in your exam prep, as in some of you might be CFA students, some of you might be ACCA, CMA. We definitely know how to calculate the ratios, but then, it's very important that to understand this entire story, you have to have an investor view. That is what we are going to develop. Remember, financial statements analysis is something that we never do. What we do is business analysis. That is what we all are interested in. You all are analyzing a business. And to analyze a business, there are a lot of ways. You go into a Starbucks, sta stand there, observe, count how many cups they are selling. Now, all those things are very expensive. It's, it's, it's a very cumbersome process. Instead of that, what we do is we analyze financial statements. So we are basically analyzing business through financial statements. So that is the first thing that you'll need to know. We are not in the business of calculating ratios. We are in the business of analyzing the business. And for that, one of the toolkit that we have is financial statements. Okay. And that is what we are going to be speaking about today. I'll just quickly introduce myself, not more than a minute. So my name is Shannon Thomas, and I've been doing uh, financial training since more than eight years. Prior, prior to that, I've worked in the industry. So I worked with uh, JP Morgan in their investment banking team covering North American banking and asset management companies. Prior to that, I've worked with a firm named Trespista Financial Services. And uh, along with that, in the first few years of training was more freelance, more part-time. So along with that, 
I also ran an investment advisory and a boutique investment research firm, primarily interested in investing in small and mid-sized companies in the Indian equity markets. And this topic of equity investing is something very close to my heart, as in I really love doing it on a daily basis. I like to read annual reports. I like to check financial statements and in general analyze businesses what they are going through and starbucks is not a company where i've invested in and neither i want to um, advise you to invest in but the purpose of taking starbucks as an example is just so that you all can relate to these businesses very easily and i'll tell you why i'm doing it okay now first thing if you see there are a lot of successful investors and few of the most successful investors is what you see here, right? So you would definitely know this, Mr. Warren Buffett. So he's one of the most successful investors. I don't know whether you would be knowing him. He's Philip Fisher. He's written a very well-known book, Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. Then you have Howard Marks. He's the fund manager at Oak Tree Capital Management. He invests a lot in distressed debt securities. Then you have Benjamin Graham, right? More than an investor, he has also been an teacher, right? He is the one who has written some very well-known books, Intelligent Investor, Security Analysis. Then we have Peter Lynch. On paper, his mutual fund performance has be been better than Warren Buffett. So he was the one who managed the Fidelity Magellan Fund. And he has had a CAGR of more than close to 30%. And then this is Charlie Munger, the partner of Warren Buffett. Now, all these are some of the most successful investors. And if you see, all of them have very, very similar investment philosophy. The way they look at businesses, the way they analyze financial statements are very, very similar. And that is what that approach is what we are trying to learn today. Now, and the best part is most of their wisdom is available very, very easily at very low cost. Now, Warren Buffett, he shares letters to shareholders on the website of Berkshire Hathaway. And these letters, you will find it for the last 50 years, right? You look at Philip Fisher, his entire philosophy is there in Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. Charlie Munger, he writes letters to shareholders of Vesco. So the idea here is that their, their wisdom is out in public at very, very low cost. You don't even have to spend $20, right? And that is what slowly we are going to learn. We are going to have a style of thinking. And once we have a style of thinking, then financial statements will start making sense. Clear? Now, I'm going to refer a lot to Warren Buffett's style of analyzing, Warren Buffett's style of thinking. Clear? Now, there are a lot of letters to shareholders that he has written. And several times in his letters, maybe six or seven times in his letters, he has said, what do they look for? So Charlie, that is Charlie Munger, and I look for companies that have four parameters. One, a business we understand, right? Now, when we say a business we understand, this is a very, very subjective thing. You might understand some business. I might understand some business. So the first thing is whether you even really understand the business, right? Now, there is no textbooks or there is no course that you have to do for this. You just need to inherently understand a business, right? Second is favorable long-term economics. Now, this is where financial statements might help us, right? Through financial statements, we can gauge whether the business is good and whether the business is expected to remain good. And I'm not saying that only through financial statements. There are other ways also. Like a lot of investors, they believe a lot in scuttlebutt. That is, they actually go and speak with employees, speak with competitors, speak with customers, Right. And that is also another way. But at times we might not be able to do that for 50 companies or 20, 30 companies. Right. So it's way more easier just going through a financial statement. Another very important thing is enable and trustworthy management. And finally, what he says is a sensible price tag. Right. This is where we learn about valuation. This is mainly financial statement analysis. Right, or analyzing financial statements to ask or to answer this question, does the business have favorable long-term economics? And this is exactly copy-paste from Letters to Shareholders 2007, the year 2007, clear? Now, let us look at criterias one by one. So remember, there are four criteria. 
that is said a business we understand favorable long term economics stable and trustworthy management and a sensible price tag now whenever you are analyzing any company right before you even take the income statement and balance sheet of those companies you can definitely see the numbers right as in total assets total liabilities revenue ebitda you will always see that doesn't as in that that is just numbers if you are looking uh, at a business that you don't understand it will never be a story if you really want to understand the story behind numbers the first thing that you have to ask yourself is can you really think like a customer of this company right i think most of us or if not almost all would have been to a starbucks store before we know what they do what they sell how they make money what do we really want from them right so we can definitely think like a customer can you think like a competitor if you are a competitor of starbucks what are the problems that you might face right it's a well known brand if you have to set up a store next to starbucks what all you have to do and then can you even think of that now on the other hand if i ask you to analyze adnoc or let's say analyze a high tech company like let, let's say even uh, spacex right there is no point as in we, we we might be fascinated about what they do but we might never be able to understand what the business is about the numbers won't make any sense at all third who you know how the company makes money what do they do in plain and simple words i know that oh yeah they sell coffee at times they sell snack items they sell croissant or what what do they sell how do they get their revenue and do you know some other competitors in the business right if you answer these questions and if you can answer these questions go ahead start analyzing the company other than that don't even look at the company financial statements you can easily calculate ebitda margin you can calculate return on equity but then all those things have absolutely no meaning as such clear so this is basically the criteria one next a very important thing is favorable long term economics now the most important thing if i have to look at any business right as in if you ask me let let's say you all must have seen football right if you ask me who is the best goalkeeper and if I, or if i ask you who is the best goalkeeper and give me one metric one number i i, mean, I, I don't want a lot of subjective answers just one number based on which i know who is the best goalkeeper you would say someone who scores a lot scores someone who saves a lot of goals if i ask you who is the best striker you will say someone who scores a lot of goals right exactly now if i ask you who is the best batsman in cricket you will say someone who has highest average right so this way if i ask you what is a good business as in there are 100 ratios but if there is one single metric which is a proof that a business is good or bad is roce which is nothing but return on capital employed some other variation of this is roe which is return on equity right but the basic idea here is when a business puts in capital on an yearly basis how much do they earn out of it you have a business which earns 5% return on capital shut down that business right because 5% is something that i can earn passively investing in bonds so if one is doing a business right you need an return on equity or return on capital of at least 12 13 14% 14%, and it has to be scalable this is very very important now a small shop here as in you can see these in in this region you will see a lot of bakala stores or these small shops right a small tea shop might have a very high roc right as in they have, they will have on the basis of what they invest their return on capital employed might be 50 60% but what do they do with that money right can you set up one more no at times it's not scalable right so you really you really need a business which is scalable and at the same time earns a high return on equity there are lot of businesses which earn a high return on capital employed but they are not scalable so all that high roce that they earn have to be given back to the shareholders in the form of dividends you need businesses that earn a high return on capital employed and there is scale in that business they can reinvest that at similar return on capital clear and a business that has lesser financial and business risk right 
Now, these are just ways to evaluate whether the long-term economics of this business is favorable or not. Now, yeah, Anand, we have started. I think there might be some issue at your, at your end. Speakers might not be working or something else. So just check once. Okay, yeah. Now, everything that I've taken, all information that I've taken is either from annual reports or conference call transcripts or investor presentation. So I'll just show you where y'all will get all these information if you all ever have to do something like this. So whenever you go to any company's website, this is the website of Starbucks, just check the investor relations section. Every publicly listed company will have this section. Now here, especially for US-based companies, everything will be very, very organized. In financial data, you will get SEC filings. That is these 10K, 10Qs that are filed with SEC. You will get them here for every year, right? So for 2021 or 2017, you want annual report, you will get it here, right? So I have taken some information from these annual reports and I've taken some information and this is very, very important. Events and presentations. Now, most managements are willing to talk to analysts like you and me, right? And these conference calls that happens, you can attend them. All you have to do is then one ISD call, right? You can attend them. And the best part is their transcripts are available, right? So if you see Starbucks Q1 earnings call, you will have their transcript. So in the transcript, what you would see is the entire conversation that happened between analyst and the CEO, CFO would be there here, right? So if you see corporate participants, right? The president, CEO, all of them have joined, right? And then there are analysts. If you see an analyst from Barclays has joined and our analyst from Goldman has joined, an analyst from Coven has joined, right? There are many analysts who have joined and you, even as an individual investor can participate. You cannot ask questions, especially with these big companies, but you can always attend these conference call. And in case you don't attend, this 19 page transcript is anyways here. And you see here, there'll be a lot of questions that an analyst can ask. So let's say Kevin Johnson, now this is basically some answers given by the CEO. This is basically a question asked by an analyst at Bofa Securities, which is Bank of America. And they will talk about same store sales growth and all these information can be directly asked. Based on this, I've taken some information. Now, do you know what is the average return on capital? That is when you set up a store, how much do you think, any, any guesses, how much do you think would be the cost to set up an average Starbucks store? What would be the cost? How much would they have to invest to set up an average store? Three million. Three million, yes. Any other answers? Think like a businessman, right? You should be able to understand this business. What do you think? Any answers? You can put it in the chat box to set up a Starbucks store. Shamsa says two million. Good, Shamsa, you seem to have a coffee shop. Hemant, 500K. Saket, 5 million. Okay, yeah. So definitely see, there are some very large ones. There are some small ones. On an average, this company requires around 1.3 million to set up an average store, right? The average store that they have costs around 1.3 million. Now you might ask me, how did I get this information, right? One conference call transcripts. Right in conference call transcripts, read last five year conference call transcript. You will see some questions on this. Two, how do you verify it? How do you know whether they are saying the truth or not? You look at for any particular year, you look at what is the PPNE purchases. That is, how much have they spent on buying new assets divided by new stores opened? clear and the good thing is starbucks they give you this information so on an average what you would see is they invest around 1.3 million now what is the operating profit on a per store basis so a per store of starbucks in a year makes a 
profit, which means all costs are getting covered, like, like product cost, store operating expenses, and even I have allocated your CEO salary also over as, and I've just divided it by the total stores. So here, operating profit is nothing, but I looked at Starbucks operating income, dividing it by the total profit, the total stores that they own. Now, if you look at this number, it's almost 20%. So Starbucks runs a business, runs a coffee shop where they invest money and they earn approximately 20% return on this. First criteria, if you remember, was business should have a high return on capital employed. But is it scalable? Can they grow? Can they keep doing it? Right? Can they keep doing this investment of 1.3, 1.3 and keep on growing it? That is the most important part. Clear? Because remember, again, trying to relate to some, something that you would have studied in your CFA and all, you would have heard this, that a company can grow at ROE, return on equity, multiplied by retention ratio, right? Or ROE into one minus the payout ratio. Now, the idea here is a company like Starbucks can keep growing at 20, 20%. If they can reinvest all the money and this is hugely scalable then, right? But we need to understand, we need to see whether these growth opportunities are really there, right? Again, you'll have to read, you'll have to go through. Now this, if you see, so sorry, this, if you see is 2016, right? This is Starbucks in 2016, in 2016, in America, they had 9,000 stores. Okay. In China, they had 1,200 stores. And these are the other regions. Now here, let me show you 2021. Fast forward five years, US, they have around 9,800 stores. So is there a massive growth in US? No. Right, as in from 9,000, they have come to 9,800, not a massive growth, maybe 10% growth in the last five years. But look at China. China, if you see, was 1,200 stores. Today it is 5,000. So almost 4x in the last few years. And understand that this is just the start, right? In India, another second most populated country. Any guesses how many Starbucks is there in India? As of now, how many Starbucks are there in India? Now that is their second fastest growing business. That is their strategy. Saket says 7,500, right? 3,000, right? You'd be surprised. Let us just check. I'll show it to you. Total Starbucks stores in India. Maybe you might not believe. Starbucks stores in India, right? It is just 252, right? Exactly. Hardly 250 Starbucks store is there. Now, if you see, if you read their conference calls, they have been very, very vocal about one thing. Our growth strategy has been, is going to be India and China. And over time, they will have more stores, India and China, they will have more stores than what they have in the US, right? So scalability, again, I'm not saying that this is an advice to invest. I'm just giving you a pattern to think, right? How do you think about growth? Are there growth opportunities available, right? So this is basically, and you could look at conference calls also to check, okay? Yeah, now Taha has another view, right? Great potential, but T will remain the king. Yeah, exactly. Now, this is also another way of looking at it. And remember, that is the that is the entire essence of market, right? Uh, you have a market. You have someone who's ready to buy, someone who's ready to sell, because there are opposing views. There are different views, and that is also very very healthy. That builds a market. So you never know whether they will execute or not. But you'll have to start thinking. You'll have to start measuring quarter by quarter how many stores are they adding? Are they executing it? Okay. Yeah, exactly. And more scalability in US seems to have saturated. Now I'll tell you what is their company's plan. As per conference call reports, what they say is 
एट परसेंट ग्रोथ एवरी ईयर सो दे वॉन्ट टू इंक्रीज देर स्टोर काउंट बाई एट परसेंट एवरी ईयर राइट दिस वे दे कीप ऑन इन्वेस्टिंग द मनी टू earn that 20 20% return on capital right and if they keep on doing it they might even keep on growing their business that way clear so if you see that answers to some extent does the business have a high roc yes approximately 20 business should be scalable yes there are a lot of there are a lot of markets where they have not even captured these markets as it they have just started entering so maybe yes getting it and see as an investor it's not one time job you cannot invest and forget every every quarter when they come with a report card you have to check whether your thesis is unfolding are they really adding stores in china are they really adding stores in india if not accept that you made a mistake in your judgment no egos to be hurt that's it sell it off clear as in you just have to track whether the thesis is unfolding or not next should also look at whether the business has a lot of financial risk and business risk now this is where you might need to look at income statements and again not calculate ratios back of the envelope calculations like when i look at the financial statements what do i see this is a company i'll directly look at let's say operating income what do i see This is a company that earns. In twenty twenty one, they earned four point eight billion. Yes, very good, Rachna. In twenty twenty, they earned one point five billion. Why? This was basically COVID, right? People used to make fun. Right now, companies will come up with a metric called as EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, and the COVID impact. But anyways, this is one point five billion, and this. Four billion, right? And if you just ignore this, so from four billion to four point eight billion, that's like a twenty percent growth in operating income from two thousand nineteen to twenty twenty one. Now, compare this with the interest expense that they have. Four sixty nine million, four thirty seven million, three thirty one million, right? Now, that is approximately. if you see 10x so your operating income right or you might call it interest coverage ratio or ebitda coverage ratio or uh, your operating income to interest expenses there are different numbers to it or this different ways to look at it but uh, approximately 10 times coverage gives someone a lot of safety right when you all are investing so this is another way of looking at it right just to check whether the business has those potential risks or not another way i really like looking at it is from a working capital perspective right now starbucks if you look at this business model one of the reasons why starbucks has a very high return on capital employed is because working capital is literally negative see how do you look at capital return on capital employed you might look at operating profit operating profit divided by your capital employed now in capital employed there are two types of capital that a business might have to invest in there's fixed capital plus working capital now there are lot of businesses that have and then the good ones might have this working capital could be negative which actually improves their return on capital employed again here i am not taking some exact formulas and all the purpose is to understand the bigger picture so if you see here ideally your current assets when you look at working capital you should not be looking at cash and cash equivalents if i just look at these numbers 162 940 1.6 billion and 594 i have somewhere around let's say a uh, Three point five billion dollar investment in current assets. Clear? Now, that to a large extent is funded by a one point two billion accounts payable. So, which means if I have inventories, 
right? All the coffees and all. I don't have to invest for that. There's a lot of things that have been funded by my suppliers, right? There's a lot of accrued liabilities, right? There are other payroll. Now, all these liabilities, right? There are a lot of customers who pay in advance. How? Look at your stored value card liability. Now, the stored value card liability is nothing but customers who have in a way paid in advance, right? Now, if you add this, you have a number of close to $6 billion, clear? Now, if I just look at working capital, right? Generally, academics teach working capital as current asset minus current liabilities. On the other hand, if you look at working capital as the operating current assets, that is what is the amount of assets invested in the business minus how much of that is being funded by suppliers or external creditors, except for banks, what you would see is this is basically a company that has negative working capital. You look for businesses around most businesses that have a negative working capital would be, again, I'm not saying in every line of business, but in most businesses, it's, it's rare to find a negative working capital business unless it's a very, very good business. Look at maybe Unilever, look at Procter and Gamble, look at Johnson and Johnson. They will have very little receivables, right? They won't have a lot of inventory. They would want distributors to take away their inventory soon. But on the liability side, you will see huge account payables, right? So these are some ways in which you can bring your capital employed lower so that the return on capital employed can be maximized. Clear? Again, these are just ways of looking at financial statements, right? So if you see, coming back, does the business earn a high ROC? Yes. Is the business scalable? Yes. A lot of, there, there are a lot of markets yet to be catered. Do they have lesser financial risk? Yes, because high interest coverage, lesser debt to equity, high interest coverage which means they don't really need to worry about the interest expenses. Business risk is generally more subjective in nature. Do you think interest coverage, calculated? interest coverage, you could look at EBIT divided by interest expense. Okay. Now, none of these are gap metrics. You look at 10 different sources, you will get 10, diff 10 different ways of calculating it. But the logic is how much the business earns and how much they have to pay in interest payments, right? And if there is a significant margin here, you know that the business is less risky. Clear? Next. So let, let's say I have a tick here, right? Is it a business? I understand. Yes. Does it have favorable long-term economics, right? Don't spend a lot of time calculating everything. You just have to look at return on equity or return on capital employed. You look at, in general, what are the interest coverage ratios to make sense out of it. Then, able and trustworthy management. Now, this is, again, very, very subjective in nature. Very difficult to say whether it is able and trustworthy management. But again, I'm just saying that there are these are just two, three ways of looking at it. Right? So if I just come there, there are two factors. Able trustworthy. Now, what do you basically mean by the management being able? One way of checking that is their track record of execution. Have they been able to stick to their guidance? Most of these companies, they come up with guidance that, yeah, next year we might reach here. After that, we might reach here. So basically you're testing or checking their execution capability. Now, how you could do that is you check the guidance, measure guidance, versus actual performance, right? You could look at a lot of operational metrics also. The company says we will be able to grow at 8% and the number of stores that we have, we will be able to grow at 8%, right? Does the company do it, right? So these are just ways in which you can check whether the company is or the management team is able. Second is trustworthy. Now, when we say trustworthy, again, it's not so easy as in as easy as Oh yeah, this is a good promoter. There's a bad promoter or there's a bad management. It's not that easy. So when you have to measure trustworthiness, 
you can only check through actions right do they really reward shareholders right is the management honest check management compensation versus growth in the profits right is the mind shareholder the promoter the the founders and the ceos the management team minority shareholder friendly right what are ways to looking at this is one do they really buy back stocks or do they announce dividends is one salary compensation structure you can check and all these things are there openly available in financial statements so you could basically check all of them now if you see here uh this is again a screenshot from starbucks annual reports so sorry it's from a investor presentation till date they have returned around 45 billion dollars right back to shareholders right uh in the for, as in they have announced stock buyback plans right although very recently as in after we announced this they had recently cancelled the buyback plan but then till date they have announced huge buybacks in the past i'll show that to you in the cash flow statements also what they have done and uh even going further they have announced huge buybacks now again these are seen as good signs where companies they don't enter into needless acquisitions right so there are a lot of in fact warren buffett tell, tells a wonderful thing that cash rich companies are like kids outside a candy store they need every chocolates out there exactly that way there are a lot of cash rich companies they enter into some completely different businesses they acquire companies which are not at all in their they basically core areas and these are ways of either burning cash or at times even siphoning off money right but this is seen as a good sign that when yeah in 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 times where expansion opportunities are less this company has rewarded the shareholders and even further what they have said is we will continuously buy back stocks too and at the same time we will continuously expand also how do you know that let me just prove that to you and this again is something that you all could do for any company that you look at very important now this is the cash flow statement of starbucks right so in the cash flow statement look at the net cash provided from operating activities which means this is what they have generated from their coffee business from their core business so if i do this cfo in the last 3 years is 5989 million 1597.8 million and 5047 million now if i add all these close to 12 billion dollars so in the last 3 years right basically i can say starbucks has generated 12 billion in the last 3 years right what did they do with this 12 billion dollars right let us just check this have they invested right because if you want them to grow they should be investing clear how much have they invested in buying new assets so if you see additions to property plant and equipment now when i look at this do i see around 1470 then 1483 then around 1806 so again i'm just trying to get a direction so yeah they have earned around 12 billion dollars they have invested in growth right some of this could be maintenance capex also right some of this could be invested into their existing stores or it, it might not be growth but still this is basically what they are investing now one way is comparing this with depreciation if this amount is very close to depreciation then they are just maintaining their operations but if this is way more than depreciation right so if you look at their depreciation 
is what I see is including amortization. Now they have not given the breakup, but there's some amortization amount also, which is around 1.5 billion. But here in this case, right, again, we cannot go purely by some mechanical rules. We know that they've been investing a lot of this in setting up new stores. And there is basically given to shareholders. So in the last three years, how much have they given to shareholders? That you can check here. So if you see cash dividends paid, so every year they pay around two, two billion dollars. So six billion they have repaid this way itself. They have also repurchased stock, right? They have repurchased here 1.6 billion. Here they have repay, repurchased worth 10 billion. So see, I'm not in, we really don't have the time to get into these numbers and nitty gritties. But the idea here is these are financial statements through which you can really check what are they really doing with the money, right? How much they are earning through business? What are they really doing, right? Are they really giving back to shareholders or are they really reinvesting in growth? So these are some ways in which you could look at financial statements to gauge what is really happening in the business. Another thing that you'll really need to know while analyzing the management is, now Warren Buffett has said a wonderful thing. So he says, there's seldom one cockroach in the kitchen. You know, you turn on the light and all of a sudden they all start scurrying around. Now, this is very, very important when you all are analyzing businesses or especially while analyzing management, right? As an outsider, we have very, very limited information about the company, right? We cannot do much, right? So all you are looking for is, do I really see one cockroach? Do I really see some inconsistencies in their numbers, right? You, you might see that, oh yeah, the CEOs is charging a lot of royalty or the founders might be charging a lot of royalty or are they entering into needless acquisitions? Do they change their auditors a lot, right? So any of these red flags, when you see, you will have to just put them as red flags, right? As in, there is no object, uh, there, there, there is no mathematical way to look at it. But yeah, the idea here is just check for red flags. And the moment you see a few red flags, just give it a pass, right? As in, again, he, Warren Buffett itself, he tells a wonderful thing that it is investing is like baseball without strike. Now, when you're playing baseball, right? A ball is thrown at you. Now, if you don't hit the ball, it's a strike. And after a particular point, you're out, right? Similarly, if you're playing cricket, you, you have to play shots, right? Otherwise, there is a stump behind you, right? On the other hand, imagine if I tell you that, oh yeah, you're playing cricket without stumps behind you and or you are playing baseball without strike, then you really don't have to play every ball. You just have to play those balls, right? You just have to hit those balls, which are really in your comfort zone, right? So exactly that way, even in investing, you really don't have to have an opinion about every company, right? Or if you're unable to form an opinion about a company, leave it. There are 5,000 companies, right? And you just really need few companies. Now, when I say few, hardly three or four to really change your financial fortune, right? So it's all about building a high conviction portfolio. And in such cases, you really need to be very, very strict while analyzing management and businesses. Now, Anmol has asked a question. Is having a lot of inventory and very less cash a red flag? Now, very good question, Anmol. Now here, the way I would look at is one, what kind of inventory is this? Is it raw material or is it finished goods? Now, if there's a lot of finished goods and it has been piling up, right? Companies making finished goods, but unable to sell, that definitely could be, again, not red flag on the management side, but maybe a red flag on the business side, as in maybe they are unable to sell. On the other hand, if this inventory is increasing because of, let, let's say, raw material prices, you know, raw materials increasing, maybe they are preparing for a next phase of growth. Right, so increase in inventory can be thought of in multiple ways. You maybe have to look into the notes and try to understand which inventory is going up. Is it raw material or is it finished goods? Okay, so 
next moving ahead is basically a sensible price tag right now again in academics we have learned that valuation is oh yeah some complex approach and then you find and uh, basically there's a formula which tells you what the price should be that's not how it is valuation is never an exact science you cannot value a company with precision right nobody knows what the intrinsic value is and your job is also not to calculate the intrinsic value right benjamin graham had said a wonderful thing he says you don't need a weighing machine to say whether a person is overweight or underweight right and that is your job your job is to say whether a person is overweight or underweight your job is not to say whether what's the weight and if a person's weight is really too close to call overweight or underweight don't make an opinion right and exactly that way there are a lot of cases it, it's just that we want to ask ourselves are we really overpaying for it right when you have found a good business when you have found a good management when you have found a business that you understand there is scalability there is high roc you need to check are you grossly overpaying for it are you paying like a 100 times pe maybe tesla would be one such company right as it's a good business their scalability management seems good right but then are you really ready to pay 1 trillion dollar right in market cap so that is basically a question that you might have to ask now when it comes to valuation how it is done in the industry there's absolute valuation relative valuation in the industry people rely a lot on relative valuation which is simple relative valuation is all about looking at multiple ratios right you look at pe ratio you look at price to book price to sales price to cash flow now if you look here these are data as per yesterday yesterday closing mcdonald's these are some peers mcdonald's has a pe ratio of 25 approximately kfc that is yum brands has around 22 tim hortons around 21.5 Starbucks, 21.1. Now, the lowest PE is basically also an indication that definitely they are not, it, it's at least relatively, it's not so expensive. In fact, this is cheapest in their industry. So Starbucks could be the cheapest in the industry. I'm not saying that McDonald's is expensive. Maybe their business is better than Starbucks. You have to evaluate what is the return on capital employed for one store of McDonald's. Right? You don't know that. So these are few things that you might have to evaluate and analyze. But yeah, this is one of the ways. Second way, which is done a lot in the industry is financial models. So I'll just show you this, how financial modeling is done. So in financial models, you try to forecast the income statements, the balance sheet, the cash flow statements, right? So if you see here, this is just a case where Starbucks financial model we've created, right? You try to forecast how much is basically the store growth rate, the rate at which stores will grow, right? The rate at which revenue per store will grow. Based on this, you try to forecast. Again, no need to get into the details of this, but the idea is analysts, they make detailed financial models. They try to forecast income statements, try to forecast balance sheets, once income statements and balance sheets are forecasted, use them and use your indirect method of cash flows and calculate the cash flow from operations cash flow and then try to calculate the free cash flows and then find the present values. So this is basically a DCF model, very as in very popularly used in the industry, right? Now, a typical DCF model might look something like this, where you first input historical financial statements, right? You input historical balance sheets, you make a forecast about the operational metrics, and then you have cash flows into future, right? That is basically how you would look at valuation. Now, even here with valuation, DCF, as you would know, is definitely not an exact science. Nobody can forecast. In fact, there's a wonderful quote says, which says that, in today's world, the most widely used software for writing fictional stories 
is not Microsoft Word, it is Microsoft Excel, right? Because yeah, these all are stories, yeah, it will keep on growing, but it at least gives you a reference point. It at least gives you a thesis, okay? This is what I think about the business. And based on this, this is what the value should be. Quarterly, keep on checking. Is the business going in the same direction what I have forecasted? And as long as it is, keep on investing. That is basically how one uses valuation, right? So if you see, again, I don't want to make an opinion whether this company is good, bad, cheap, expensive. But the idea is there are few things that you really want to know about a business. And there are multiple ways of knowing it. A very efficient and a good way of knowing it is through financial statements. Now, through financial statements, when you all are analyzing the financial statements, don't analyze page by page. Okay, now income statement, now balance sheet. That's not how you do it. You start with a theory. You start with a thesis that, okay, this is a growing company and it has a high return on capital employee. Test this. Check on a per store basis. What is it? Test. Are they really investing? Test through financial statements. Are they really giving back money to shareholders? So this is how it should ideally look like, right? It all needs to start with a theory in your mind about the business. And once you have a theory about the business, step into it, use the financial statements, check whether financial statements are consistent with your theory. Exactly, Anmol, you need to have a hypothesis before you dig in. Right. Otherwise, financial statements, it's, it's not a computer where you feed in financial statements. It will tell the company is good. No, financial statements have to be used on a quarterly basis to check whether whatever, whatever thesis you have about a business, is it the financial statement? Is it telling you a consistent story? Right. Otherwise, we, we just will have, uh, and then otherwise, we might just get too influenced by what people say around us and all that is where financial statements will test the validation of your hypothesis. But it is not basically the end. It is just one of the means, right? Just one of the ways to check your hypothesis. So yeah, again, we had like an hour or so. It's definitely a very, very short time to discuss this, but any questions, any thoughts you would want to share and again in in this industry there is nothing right or wrong right so any questions you'll have anything which you'll have not understood or you want me to clarify a bit more feel free to ask feel free to put your questions right and and see the purpose of this was also so that we, we study a lot we, we we all are involved in acca cfa cma frm exams but then the most important thing is trying to maybe apply all these things and really understanding that a professional charter holder or a CMA, what they really do day to day and a life of a portfolio manager or, or an investment analyst would be something like this, where they have a company, they need to analyze, they need to form an opinion and, uh, and yeah, they need to test whether it is really happening or it, if the thesis is unfolding or not. Now, Dhruv, good to have a question from you after a long time. I think it was 2019, those lockdown days. Yeah. So Dhruv, giving back to shareholders do reflect management's wisdom, but doesn't it also create a paradox that business is unable to generate high ROC and ends distributing back to shareholders? Is there a borderline to understand how much is wise to give back and how much is invested? Yes. Very, very good question. Now, the idea here is as long as you have profitable opportunities, you should go into that. See, the idea is the company has money. Now, there are two things that the company can do. Company can invest it or company can give it out as dividends. Now, the idea here is if Starbucks invests the entire amount, maybe their ROC might go down. Right? So the idea here is, is the company able to sustain a high return on capital employed? And if the company is able to sustain a high return on capital employed, then it's okay to pay dividends as in if they can keep on growing. So it's, it's a good sign paying 
giving money back to the shareholders and at the same time investing a bit in growth on the other hand if you see a company they keep on investing in the business they keep on exploiting every opportunity and eventually the roc of the business just keeps falling because there is too many starbucks now right so that is also something that you don't want so definitely there's a balance not a very not, not, not something that can be easily measured but yeah you really want a company to sustain its return on capital employed and exploit that opportunity as far as it can but at the same time you would want the company to be paying some amount of dividends or some amount of money back to shareholders also right yeah thank you rachna taha my dear colleague has asked a question one major risk is robusta coffee bean supplies falling every year due to climate change yeah exactly now this would be i've, I've come across this so this would definitely be a risk but yeah see in such cases you have to keep on checking on a quarterly basis and what's happening right with media around us what what, what generally what, what what happens is that there's a lot of noise created about this so re I, i really don't know how much would be the size of robusta coffee in case of starbucks but yeah you really need to check that on a regular basis and is it affecting it in a major way and even and if it does what is basically the way in which starbucks is diversifying itself right now siamak is frm certification valuable after finishing cfa uh see frm depends a lot on where you work if you are working working in the asset liability team within a bank or you are really working within the risk management team then yes it makes sense but purely as a portfolio manager or as an investment analyst frm won't add a lot of value but if you are working in the asset liability management team or in the risk management team yes that would add value okay now chandra while i get what pe technically is in more intuitive term pe of 20 would mean that it takes 20 years to recover the investment if the company's growth rate is 0% um uh, yes chandra you are right that is one way of looking at it that a pe of 20 means without growth it will take you 20 years to recover the share price that you are paying another way to look at it is think about it this way right another way to look at it is imagine let's say you have 100 dollars you invest this 100 dollar in a bank every year how much interest will they give you how much interest will bank give you what do you think 5 let's say bank will give you 5 so to earn 5 you are ready to invest 100 so even while you are investing in a bank account technically you are paying a 20 times pe right now i'm assuming starbucks can definitely grow bank will only keep giving you 5 5 5 5 right although the growth is more risky in a business but yeah this is also one benchmark that you can have right that uh how many times extra are you earning so inherently when you are investing in a bank you are paying a 20x pe right that is exactly what you are paying for starbucks also now but what you have said is not wrong chandra that is also correct sufian how do we find balance of time and info to carry out the activities or steps you described in analyzing a company that is over flooded with info or financial models especially for newer analysts see that is why that is why uh you need to have a theory first because when you have a theory then for, for the financial statement for you is just a way of checking that right so my theory is starbucks stores has a low margin right as in the coffee and all these things that they sell they sell at a very low margin now i just have to test so if i have a theory then i really just need to test that now information is going to confuse you or it it will become a noise only when you really don't know what to do with that information right so there's definitely a lot of information out there but if you really know what you really want to extract out of that information then having more information might only help you so as an as a as a new analyst i'll tell you what you need to do create an account in whichever market you intend to invest check 
what are the listed companies there and where i am a customer are you a customer of let's say adidas are you a customer of starbucks are you a customer of etisalat are you a customer of vodafone right as in just make a list of companies where you are a customer of right and start analyzing those companies right it is way more easier that way rather than taking a hypothetical company out and start reading about it okay now anjana can you suggest any websites to get updated with current financial market i think there are way too many these days which throws opinion about each and everything that is happening in the market uh i'll tell you what you should do again rather than staying updated with everything that is happening in the financial market let's say i'm an investor in starbucks so i really am interested in what is happening with coffee starbucks so a better thing to do is on your google right create a news alert keep a keyword as coffee starbucks robusta coffee fried coffee dried coffee or whatever as in you just keep these words right and then that's it and let the news come in from different sources right so again the better approach is rather than selecting the right source again know what you want from the news you don't want to know what is happening between uh, estonia and latvia right there might be some problems there right as in that that should not affect how you invest in let's say your local markets right so you just find things that you really are interested in knowing create a google news alert for that that would be better third secondly read conference call transcripts regularly it's a way in which you can actually know from the ceo of starbucks what is happening in their business right so these are better sources of information rather than a typical newspaper which ha or a typical cnbc tv which has to fill 24 hours with content right saket has a question can or should inflation affect an investor's decision inflation should affect an investor's decision and the only way it should affect is that it should force you to invest right and you have to look at because the biggest risk with inflation is you should not be holding cash that is exactly the reason why central banks are also creating inflation right why was inflation created due, during covid why was interest rates kept below so that people don't hold cash they bring it out that is the only way to revive economy right so with inflation yes you need to look at businesses that can have that has pricing power right companies that can increase prices without the fear of customers running away from them so yes in an inflationary world a good bet is commodity companies right essential commodities or consumer goods non discretionary so these kind of investments yes you could make yeah dhruv isn't ev to ebitda better than pe for such calculations now see ev to ebitda is a better measure when comparing companies across uh an industry having different capital structure yes so if companies have different capital structure maybe looking at pe ratio might not make sense a better approach might be to look at ev to ebitda ev is enterprise value yeah enterprise value the way you have to think of this uh see there's a business right now this business let's say starbucks you know what starbucks does they have coffee shops now to set up this entire business they got funds from shareholders and from debt they must have also have bond holders from whom they have raised money now as a shareholder i am just invest interested in market cap clear but when you look at enterprise value you are looking at the total value of the business not just the value of the shares so and that is basically what enterprise value is it is basically the total value of the business rather than just the value of the shares right how how is enterprise value calculated a simple formula for that is market value of equity plus market value of debt minus any cash that is already there in the company's balance sheet 
right so the way you could think about us uh, i generally give an example of a property imagine there is a property the property's price is let's say 300000 clear and everyone knows that inside the bathroom of this property there is cash lying there is 75000 cash lying then ideally how much are you paying for the property see if the value of the property is 300 but there is cash lying inside the bathroom so how much are you paying only for the property 225 right how you do it is you subtract cash exactly that way this is like the value of the entire business and whatever cash is there inside it's like something that you can take out anyways so what you are paying for the business is debt plus equity minus cash clear yes please yeah anmol how can we analyze financial statements for startups such as coffee app as there might not be any relevant industry yeah so you the the issue is for startups firstly the financial statement itself might not be available right so for startups it's it's financial statements have very little value to add uh management whether they have enough funds all these things will matter more now financial statement analysis would make more sense when you are looking at slightly more matured companies and that is what you would find in a stock market right a startup very rarely is what you might see in a stock market rarely as in right now you might see a lot of startups also but that is still a very very small proportion but very very difficult to uh, judge a startup by its existing financial statements you will have to look at the runway for growth in those businesses rather than anything else clear yes anusha can you suggest an approach to decide what percentage of a portfolio can i afford to dedicate towards investing again there is anusha there is no one right answer here uh depends a lot at a personal level uh as in what kind of a person you are whether you like to take risk or whether you are a very risk averse person so very difficult to put a number to it personally what i do is my downside is taken care of so i have some contingency funds uh i have some funds invested here and there i have a property everything else now after this 100% is in equity that is what i am doing maybe not right for you but and maybe there would be another more aggressive approach also but yeah what's a contingency fund contingency as in just in case of any as in you just need some money emergency maybe 7 8 months of your expenses keep it in money market mutual funds chandra i like the bank analogy but in bank for example in fd there is 100% capital preservation with low maturities p equivalent for such income will be less assuming i divide the par value now the one way of justifying higher pe chandra these days is the lower interest rate right and in fact mathematically speaking so finance has come up with a formula that the ideal pe right the ideal pe of a company should be think of this as payout ratio or you could also ignore payout ratio it should be 1 divided by r minus g where r is your required rate g is the rate at which it can grow now globally this r has come down required rate of return because risk free rates have come down now that is one of the reasons why you see asset prices being so inflated and the lower interest rate is what in a way today uh, drives these higher pe's but i am also not a fan of 50 60 times pe and all so i would also like to avoid but at times there's no other investment opportunity at all because in a bank right now you are not getting 555 you are getting 222 right so okay your 100 is safe but only the nominal value of that 100 is safe 
Five years later, when you receive hundred in an inflationary world, you have in the real case you would have received only seventy adjusted for inflation, right? So today, bank account itself is a fifty x PE. <laughs> Yeah, is it clear? Okay, perfect. So, okay, guys, I hope the session was useful and at least you've got an approach. See, again, there's very little that can be done in an hour, but I just am hoping that there was some value added or some noise cleared into what exactly this is. And I really hope what we have learned today helps you in some of the other way, maybe in your, uh, in, in your, in managing your private portfolio, or maybe, uh, well, let's say in, in applying what you study to real world scenarios. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Lalit. Thank you, Megha. Thank you, Tayaba. Thank you, Ananya. Yeah. Thank you, Dhruv. Thank you, Marian. Thank you, Ansley. Thank you, Mohammed Anjana. So good, good to see you all. And so many of you, we've studied and we've been together in the class. So good to see you all back. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you, Saket. And thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Anusha. Yeah.